Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 150. It's a landmark of some sort for some reason. And we're going to talk about how to get unstuck. You've done it. You've got your van stuck. What are you going to do now? We're also going to talk about the fraught topic of K&N filters, a place to visit that is not safe for work, and how to use your phone to do some things you might not have realized it could do. And that's coming up right as soon as the music ends. Okay, good. It ended. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me once again. We have a fairly normal episode this week. (laughs) I think we're back to normal here. Finally, maybe. Uh, I wanted to talk about getting stuck. I mean, we just had this big storm. There's cars stuck all over the place in Buffalo. If you are in Buffalo, I'm terribly sorry, and um, good luck to you. (laughs) That's all I have to say. I hope you're staying warm. But uh, yeah, you know, we're driving our vans all over the place, and a lot of us get stuck. I have gotten my vehicles stuck many times. Uh, My Land Rover, I got stuck fairly often, and I've never gotten my vans stuck. Now, isn't that interesting? Land Rover, very capable 4x4 vehicle with lots of electronics and everything designed to not get you stuck and then to get you unstuck, but I got stuck in it. Van, never got stuck, and I've driven in some fairly gnarly places. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is, is that the first rule of getting unstuck is obviously not to get stuck. And I don't drive my van the way I drove my Land Rover. I kind of was an idiot sometimes when I was driving the Land Rover. There's no question. A couple of the times I got stuck were just me showing off or doing something stupid because it's really fun driving a vehicle like that. You want to see what it can do and you want to push limits. And when you push limits... That's when you get stuck. Now, you're driving a van around. You're driving your home. This is precious cargo here. You have to drive differently, even if, if not especially if, you have an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive van. There is this thing that happens every time there's a big snowstorm. Cars go off the road and they're abandoned. And if I've driven through these snowstorms after the fact, and most of the cars that are off the road are four-wheel drives because people don't get it. Four-wheel drive will help you get over things that you couldn't get over and help you get through things you couldn't get through, but it's not going to help you stop. And if you get stuck in a four-wheel drive, you're honestly in worse shape in some cases, especially if you're stuck in mud. You can dig all four wheels down in the mud, and then you end up what's called high-centered, which is where the ground or a rock or something is actually touching the bottom of your vehicle, making your wheels completely useless, and you're in a world of hurt then. You definitely don't want to do that. But how do you avoid getting stuck normally? You drive prudently. One of the big mottos in the Land Rover community, of which I'm no longer a part, is slow as possible, fast as necessary. And you'll see RVs say that too. And that that's the mentality to have. If you're driving somewhere a little bit sketchy, you want to go as slow as you possibly can, and you only use speed to help you not get stuck. An example of that is in Vermont in the spring when the dirt roads get really, really soft. They call it mud season. A mistake a lot of new people make is that when they're driving along the firm road and it starts to get soft, they'll slow down or they'll start to spin their wheels and they'll stop. No. In that case, you want to try to go faster because the momentum of the vehicle doesn't care how soft the road is. The momentum is going to carry you through no matter what. And you want to use that momentum to your advantage. So a lot of this is just skill and experience and generally just driving gently. That's really the big thing. But it's also about being prepared. If you know you're going to be going to the ski resorts of Colorado in the winter, you have to have chains. Just get changed. Just that's part of your expense for doing that. There's no question about this. It's required by law on many of the roads. Get chains and learn how to use them. Put them on, take them off three times. Do it three times before you go on your trip, and you should have it down by then. And those chains are something you can leave in your rig all year round. Now they're not they're they're heavy. I mean, obviously you may not want these big heavy things in your rig all year round, but they can help you get unstuck if you get stuck even in the mud. So. Food for thought there. 
Now, there's two times people get stuck. One is if they drive on a surface and lose traction, and the other is if they can't stop. They can't brake properly. And that's where the four-wheel drive people get in trouble, because four-wheel drive does not mean four-wheel braking. You can't brake any better in a four-wheel drive than you can in a regular vehicle. And if you stomp on the brakes on an icy patch, your four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive or whatever is going to act exactly the same as a vehicle that has one-wheel drive. So there's two basic problems of getting unstuck. There's the traction problem, and then there's the obstacle problem or the gravity problem. So let's talk about the traction problem first. Let's say that you've driven into a patch of mud, or you're on some ice, or you're in some snow. Those three things are sort of similar. Well, the old tried and true method to get unstuck from those was to rock your vehicle with the transmission. And I'm assuming you're by yourself here. If you've got help, you know, you've got other options here. But if you're by yourself in the van, you would put the vehicle in drive, gently press on the gas until the vehicle rolled forward. And just as it's about to stop, you put the transmission in reverse and do the same thing again. And if you do this, it's this rocking motion. You will notice that the momentum, I've talked about that before, the momentum of the vehicle will push you further and further. And then eventually you will get to a place that you can drive away from. The problem with this is that it can put some wear on your transmission. The, in, in electronic transmissions, a lot of the newer transmissions, well, they're, they're not going to like this, and they're going to stop you from doing this. Older vehicles, like if you've got a 95 Econoline, yeah, this is going to work fine. But a lot of the newer ones, especially if you have a CVT, it's, it's, it's different, and the transmission will fight you. But that is and was the traditional way, and that goes way back to the days of manual transmission, which for those of us in the U.S. seems like something old-fashioned, and for folks in the the rest of the world is just normal. Though you folks, hey, you've got it easy. If you have a manual transmission, it's much easier for you to get unstuck because it's easier for you to shift gears like this. Now, if that doesn't work, the number one thing you don't want to do, and some people disagree with this, is spin your wheels. If you spin your wheels, if your wheels are going and you're not moving, you're digging a hole. You're getting yourself deeper. This is one of the ways four-wheel drive vehicles really get in trouble is that they dig all four wheels down and then they're stuck in high-centered, like I said before. You don't want to do that. You don't want to spin your wheels. As soon as your wheels are spinning, stop. You're not making any progress. You're just making things worse. Now, why do some people disagree with that? Well, there's two thoughts here. One is that if you keep digging, you might hit solid ground. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe if you're spinning in like an inch of snow and you know there's gravel under there, that might work. But in my experience, it's a bad idea. The other one is a little bit strange, but if you're in mud and you have really big mud tires, knobby tires, if you spin the wheels, the wheels will pick up mud and throw backwards. And it's one of the laws of physics that if you throw something backwards, you will move in the opposite direction. And you can actually move a vehicle that way. But that's a pretty advanced technique. And I would just say, hey, don't spin your wheels. You're probably going to be better off that way. Modern vehicles have traction control, and this is a computer that will look and see if the wheels are spinning. You have sensors on all your wheels, and if they're spinning at the proper speed, because your vehicle's smart, it knows how the wheels should be spinning, and if one of those wheels is going too fast, it will slow it down by applying the brakes a little bit, and, well, that's basically how traction control works. It, it takes control of the wheels trying to give you the best possible traction. This can cause a problem if you're stuck, however, because the vehicle will change the amount of power going to the wheels outside of your control, and you won't be able to, like, override it, except you can turn it off. All vehicles have a way to turn this off. Sometimes it's obvious. In my Sprinter and NV200, it was a big button on the dashboard, and when you press that button, a yellow light would come on on the dashboard that looked like a car with two S's under it. It was basically a skidding car. Uh, that's what that's for. That's why you can turn that off. It's for when you get stuck, it will make the wheels act very predictably. You step on the gas and the wheel will spin and they won't change speed on you or anything. So that's a good thing to do is to turn that off. Sometimes that's all you need to get out, honestly. Sometimes the traction control makes you stuck and you can just turn that off and then gently go forward and it'll work. So make sure you understand how your traction control turns off. Another rule if you're stuck is don't fight gravity. Now, if you're stuck somewhere level, but, all right, this isn't the tip for you, but if you're on any kind of a hill, use the hill to your advantage. 
I told a story a while ago about how I was stuck in uh, with my Datsun 510, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later, on a very, very steep hill, and the tow truck driver just pushed it into place using gravity. He didn't need anything else because he used gravity to his advantage. So if you're stuck on any kind of a hill, gravity is going to want to pull your vehicle down the hill. Now, sometimes that's very bad because maybe there's a cliff there or a big tree or something like that. But when you're planning how you're going to recover it, think about that. Try not to fight gravity because you're almost always going to lose. Now, in those cases where you can't fight gravity, well, then you've got to step up your game a bit. Then you've got to use some equipment. Now, if you have another vehicle, they can try to help pull you out, but you have to be very careful when they do that for both vehicles and the safety of any people around. Generally, no one should be outside when, when this is happening. I mean, you can have a spotter, that's fine, that's a good thing, but have them far away from the vehicle because weird things can happen, it's unpredictable, and parts can fly and stuff, and it can be very dangerous. So you want to use a very sturdy rope made for this purpose or a chain or whatever you have, and hopefully you have some recovery equipment with you, and you want to put something over the middle of it, some kind of a blanket or a wet towel or something with a little bit of weight. And the reason that's there is so if the chain or rope or whatever it is breaks, it won't fly out that far because that weight in the middle will pull it to the ground. That's a pretty important thing because otherwise that can snap and then go through your windshield or go through the back of the car in front of you or hit somebody, which is very, very bad. It is dangerous to use another vehicle. If they go slowly and they're on the same kind of ground you're on, they're going to get stuck too. If they go too fast, they could rip off a piece of your vehicle, which happens all the time. So make sure you know what you're connecting to. Most vehicles have recovery points at the front and the back. And the front, in the bumper, there's usually a little tiny panel you remove. And then in your glove box or under your glove box or wherever your jack is, there's probably a little loop. And that screws in there, and that's how you're supposed to pull the vehicle. You're supposed to pull it from that point. That's a safe way to do it, and you know you're not going to rip off any kind of suspension components. In the back, there are usually loops just kind of built in back there underneath if you look. Or if you have a hitch, you can always use your tow hitch. That is, well, always, usually, you know, everything I'm talking about here is general. But that's also a good way to recover your vehicle. Now, if you are going to go off-road all the time, getting a winch is a great idea. But getting a winch isn't like, oh, I put on a winch, I'm safe. You have to learn how to use it. There are winching techniques. There are winching safety precautions. Winches are very good, but you have to study how to use them. I mean, all right, you're in the desert and you're off the road deep in sand. You've got a winch. You're all, uh, oh, what do you do? (laughs) What are you going to attach the winch to to pull your vehicle out? It's not easy. So winches can be useful, but you absolutely have to learn how to use them. And make sure you also know how to use a snatch block, which is a device that gives you more power with a winch. If you don't want to spend the money for a winch, and I totally understand that, there is a thing called a come-along, which is a manual winch, basically. And it's this big lever that you pull and go forward, pull, go forward, and it will slowly wrap up a piece of wire cable, and it can help you in the same way. It's not as versatile as a winch, and someone has to be outside the vehicle to use it. It's also a lot cheaper, so you've got that option, too. Now, a very popular thing for off-roaders, and a very good thing, are what's called Max Tracks. These are big plastic things that look like sleds, almost, that you have to store somewhere in your vehicle. But they will help you in all these situations, because they have great traction. And you put them under your wheels, or basically in front of your wheels. And then once your tires get on them they tend to not slide and you can drive over them. They're not perfect. And this is one of those things where the more expensive brands actually do perform better than the cheaper ones. But uh, that's the thing to have. If you're going to be in these situations often, you probably want to invest in a pair of these Max Tracks and put them on the roof or something. And, and, and don't put them under your vehicle. I saw somebody mount them where the spare tire was. And I was like, no, that's not going to work because that's where you're going to need to get to if you're stuck. It's in the mud. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Other thing you could do, and you should do this anyway, is air down. If you're stuck in the mud or the snow or you're starting to slip and you're worried you're going to get stuck, air down. Take the air out of your tires. Not all the air, but take a good portion of air out of your tires. Now, hopefully you have an air compressor. Everybody driving should have an air compressor and a tire repair kit. But 
yeah, this is going to take some time. It takes a little bit of time to air down the tires. It's going to take time to pump them back up. But you will be amazed at how much more traction you get if you lower the air pressure in your tires. Again, you don't want to go too far because then your tire can walk itself off the rim and then you're in real trouble. But go ahead and, and air down, you know, take away 25% of the air pressure. That's pretty safe. And that will help you more than you could imagine. There's crazy stuff that people do, and I'm going to mention it, and I'm not going to recommend, you, recommend any of this because it's crazy. You can take bungee cords or a bed sheet or whatever and tie boards to your tires. <laughs> I kid you not, tractor drivers do this with some frequency. You basically take a piece of 2 by 4 and you put it on your tire so it cuts across the tire and then you tie that onto the wheel through some of the holes in the whatever you have for wheels and then you slowly go forward and that two by four is going to grab into the ground and push you forward super dangerous really good way to destroy your van but it has worked for people so yeah there's that option if all that fails and you're stuck well then you're calling a tow truck and that can be tricky AAA, we've talked about a lot, is not always reliable. They have done very well by me this year. I can't say enough good things about AAA this year, but they're not always reliable. So, especially if you're off-road. If you're, like, way off-road in Death Valley, AAA is not going to be terribly useful. You're going to have to be dealing with an off-road recovery company there. And you can easily spend $1,000 to get your vehicle unstuck if you're way off-road. But I want to point out one last thing for you here. It's called offroadportal.org. This is a group of volunteers who basically get tickets from people. People write in and say, hey, I'm stuck here. Can someone come help me? And they will organize an expedition and come out with their Jeeps and trucks and whatever they have and rescue people. And it's free. The problem is it's not instant. It's not like they're going to get you out this afternoon. It might be a week later. You basically report to them that these are the GPS coordinates of my vehicle, blah, blah, blah. And they'll get back to you and say, hey, meet us there Tuesday day three or whatever and then they will do it and they'll probably make a video out of it and, and you know it might be on youtube and that's just all part of the fun so that's the thing to be familiar with too offroadportal.org not a bad thing to write in the cover of your owner's manual or something just in case and of course you need internet access but circling back the number one best way to get out of being stuck is to not get stuck do don't be overconfident with your vehicles always have a plan for where you're going to drive and and i mean not like what city you're going to drive in like where the wheels are going to go next spend some time learning how your vehicle interacts with wet and slippery conditions and just don't push it tech doc I got a lovely note from Stephanie, and I'm actually going to read you a lot of the note here because she stated a number of things very well here, and I think we should talk about it. So this is from Stephanie. Do van windows ever need to be resealed? This fall, I've had so many flies in my van. Once I went out for a short walk on a sunny day, and when I got back, there were a dozen flinging themselves against my rear cargo door windows. I have yet to actually catch one in the act of coming in, so I can't exactly see where they're coming from but based on the fact that they always appear at the windows i think they're coming in through the window seals my van is white i've read things that say the flies are sometimes especially drawn to white or silver vehicles true and it's old an 07 with 340,000 miles good for you so it wouldn't surprise me if any factory sealant on the windows has started to degrade so here's my question do van windows ever need to be resealed if so how would one go about doing that moreover how would one go about doing that if one is short-sighted and built walls inside their van that cover up some of the interior window screens maybe i shouldn't have done that stephanie thanks very much for the note now it seems to me we have three separate problems here first is flies where are the flies coming from so there are endless remedies for flies and keeping flies out of things some people say hanging an osage orange fruit will keep them out or is that spiders i don't know uh, there's all kinds of essential oils you can spray around it whatever truth is flies are attracted to the color white that is absolutely true and they're also attracted to the smells of food or whatever other smells are coming out of your van so everyone gets flies in their vans it's just a fact. It's how you deal with them that's the issue. 
Based on what you're telling me, I don't think your window seals are the problem. It's much easier for flies to get in your vehicle through the door seals. You may not be able to see this, but most vans' back doors don't seal completely. Usually at the bottom, there's a gap. And I know in my Sprinter, if I'm in the van at night and I turn off the lights in the van, and I'm like under a street light, I can see light coming through those seals. And then I just make a mental note to fix that someday, which, you know, that note's getting very, very long. The flies are coming into your van and they're getting trapped and they just fly towards light. That's all they do. So one way to deal with them is, you know, give them a way out. If you have, say, a max air vent, one thing I have done is taken the screen off and put it on exhaust. <laughs> and that will help get rid of all the flies. Another thing is, is figure out what they're being attracted to. Now, it's not impossible that you have something in your van that's really attracting them, like a dead mouse or something like that. Make sure that isn't the case. They will be there anyway. You don't have to have a dead mouse or rotten food or like um, a stinky black tank or anything like that. I mean, those are things that all attract flies, but you don't have to have those things to get flies. Flies will come in anyway. And what a lot of people use for flies is simply a fly swatter. I mean, I'm serious. I have a fly swatter in the Tiki Bago. I had a fly swatter in my NV200. There's always going to be one or two flies that are just flying around. Now, what I've done for the winter, and if you're going to leave your van for a while, you could try this, is I bought some fly tape. This is a really old-fashioned thing. It's these coils of really sticky tape. And I hang it from wherever there's light high up. So like my Max Air fan lets light in. I'll hang one from there. And any flies that are in there are eventually going to land on that and get stuck. And so then when I come back to the van, I just can take that and throw it out and be done with all those flies. They're mostly annoying. They're not going to really do any harm, but uh, I, I absolutely feel your pain. Now, pretend it is your window seals. Let's say your window seals are bad. Yes, the proper way to replace windows on a van is to remove them. You actually remove the glass and then replace the seal and put the glass back. And some people do this themselves, but most people have a professional do this. In your van in 07 with 340,000 miles, heck no, I would never do that. The only time I'd ever mess with the glass is if the glass was broken. So if you can find an actual hole like you can look around your rubber seals and on my, my Winnebago that's 50 years old, there's, this has definitely happened. Sometimes the seals will break because they get brittle and they, they kind of contract and break. Find those breaks and you can use a black silicone product like even Flex Seal and fill in that spot. And that is going to do almost as good as resealing the entire window. It's, it's much cheaper and easier and you can see it. You could also try to adjust your rear door seals and your slider door seals, because I'll bet that's where they're coming in. But that's, that's hard. That, that actually is, is difficult. And as for getting at glass that you've covered up parts of, I'm sorry to tell you that the only way to do that is to remove the stuff you covered it up with. So word to the wise for those of you who are building your van, make sure you don't cover up windows slam vents or access ports to your taillights these are things that people frequently will cover up and then they're like oh no i need to replace my taillight but that's where my shower is that can be a very big deal <laughs> so make sure you don't cover those up in my nv200 i actually covered up the port to access the fuel pump and i knew I was doing that. So I covered it up and I said to myself, well, if they ever have to access the fuel pump, I'm just going to rip up that part of the van. I'll have to redo it. I made that calculation with myself. And I'm afraid you've made that calculation with yourself, whether you know it or not. But the good news is, is I don't think you have to do anything. So flies and vans are no fun. I'm not sure there's anything actually wrong, but you got to deal with the actual problem, I'm afraid. Oh, and one last thing. If those flies happen to be fruit flies, they're a little easier to deal with. If you take a little bit of Jack Daniels or some kind of whiskey or wine or something that is fermented and gives off an aroma, just put maybe half an inch of that in any kind of Dixie cup or plastic cup or whatever. And a t one drop, one single drop of dishwashing liquid. Put that in there and... Over time, all of those fruit flies will end up in there and maybe take two or three days, but you will catch them all. And that'll be the end of that. Tales from the road. So my first car, well, all right. My first car was a 77 Ford LTD2, an absolute boat of a car. But I didn't have that very long. When I went off to college, my parents gave me their family car 
which was four years old at the time. It was a 1980 Datsun 510. Now, the Datsun 510 turned into the Nissan Altima, so you can kind of get an idea of which car we're talking about here. But man, I loved this car. It was this four-door hatchback, had tons of space, got great gas mileage. I mean, I absolutely loved this car. And not only that, it was my first car that I really thought, hey, this is my car. And I had lots of adventures, and I've, I've told stories about it before, but I haven't told this one yet, I don't think. I was going to school in Miami Shores, Florida, at a school called Barry University. I was studying biology there. There for a year, I decided after a year that this was not for me, and I left. But while I was living there, the cost of dorm expenses was so high, and my parents liked going down there that I know this is crazy, but they basically bought a condo that I could live in right on Miami Beach. If you're ever on Miami Beach and there's uh, the Newport Hotel, which is fairly well known because there's a big lighthouse and a pier, my condo was directly across the street from that. And yeah, I was a little bit spoiled, um, you know, going to a, a private liberal arts college, had a fairly new car and a condo. Huh. Anyway, but it, in a way that all made financial sense. <laughs> so... My car was in a fairly serious accident before I went down there. It did highway speeds. It hit the guardrail and kind of rounded off all four corners. I was not driving. And we repaired it, but not up to where it should have been. It was just enough to make it drivable. So the front fender was replaced, and it was just black. And this was a bright yellow car. So I had this bright yellow car with one black fender. It was kind of weird looking. And I thought, well, what if I just painted the rest of the car and... Well, I don't want to paint the whole car. And then I was like, oh, what if I just painted the corners black? It seemed like a perfectly reasonable idea to me at the time, but I was living in a condo in Miami. Where am I going to do this? Well, I went to Home Depot or whatever they had for Home Depots down there and bought a whole bunch of spray paint, got a whole bunch of newspapers, and drove into this kind of wooded area behind the condo. And it seemed kind of abandoned. I mean, there was an old houseboat there that was kind of half sunk and on the shore. And there were piles of construction debris. And in fact, the construction trailers that were used to build the condos like 20 years earlier were still there. So I don't know what that was about. But it, it didn't look like I'd be bothering anybody there. So I drove out there and I used the newspaper to cover the windows and stuff. And I'm painting away, having a great time. And then I see some blue and red lights. And I look and some cops have come and driven up right behind me. So I've got the spray paint and the cops are there and I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. And I just kept spray painting the car, which probably seemed odd to them. Now this car had Massachusetts plates on it in Florida, which probably also seemed odd to them. And uh, yeah, after a couple of minutes, and I don't know what they were doing, I guess they were running the plates or something. Um, they came out and very gently and under control, asked me what the hell I was doing. <laughs> and um, I said I was painting my car. And they didn't really question me very much about that. They asked me if I'd seen anybody else out there. And I said, no. And after a couple minutes, they just left. And they left me there painting the car. And at first I thought they were going to get mad at me for littering or something. Or they didn't even ask to see my driver's license. It was a very odd exchange, and I didn't think too much about it. Uh, and then a couple weeks later, I wanted to do some more touch-up paint. So I went back out there, and there was a car there. And I there was kind of like a road there, and people maybe would drive through. So I thought the car was moving. So I pulled up behind it, expecting it to keep moving, and it didn't. It stopped. And then another car pulled in behind me, and I was sandwiched between these two cars. And I could see that the two cars weren't happy I was there, but they wouldn't get out of their cars and talk to me. And I didn't know what was going on, so I stayed in my car. And then eventually the car in front of me floored it and peeled off out of there, and I just slowly followed at a normal pace and got the heck out of there. And I realized why the cops were there. This was a famous spot in the neighborhood for drug deals that I just happened to pick to spray paint my vehicle because I'm so very good at that. And uh, yeah, so I'm happy I found some cops that didn't want to mess with me. And I have the privilege of being who I am. And I'm not sure somebody else would have had the same experience, but I still have dreams about that car uh, and I miss it. Product review. It's a very short 
product review. Uh, when I bought my ambulance, under the hood, there's the air cleaner. And on the air cleaner, there's a sticker that says K&N filter, do not replace. So K&N filters are quote unquote permanent filters. You don't replace these air filters. You buy them, they're expensive, you put them in the vehicle and K&N claims they give you much better performance than the stock filters. And bonus, you never have to replace them. You just clean them with oil every so many miles or something. Now it is impossible to say anything about k and filters and not get people mad at you. I can say they're the best thing in the world, I can say they're the worst thing in the world, and somebody's not gonna like that answer. So, okay, <laughs> that said, I'm gonna tell you what I think. I think they're a gimmick. I don't think they're worth buying and I think you should avoid them for a few reasons. First off, if there was a better air filter that the car manufacturers could put in the vehicles, they would do it. They are the experts on those engines. They know more about them than anybody else, and they are not going to save 10 bucks on a crappy air filter that's going to shorten the life of the engine. It's just not what they do. Second, the way K&N air filters improve performance, and they can, they can, is that they let more air through. And there are claims that the way they let more air through is that they let more dust through too, and that's the entire point of the filters, to keep dust out of your engine. So in my opinion, K&N air filters are a waste of money and you shouldn't buy them, nor should you buy their oil filters or anything else with their name on it. You can watch YouTube videos that will tell me I'm completely wrong and you can watch other ones that will tell me I'm exactly right. You have to decide for yourself. But I do know this, when I bought my ambulance, it had that K&N sticker on the air cleaner, but there was no K&N air filter in there. Somebody had replaced it with the standard Mercedes-Benz paper filter. A place to visit. I have not been to this place, and I think maybe it's on my bucket list. I'm I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> I am going to be in Miami this year, and I was looking for things to do, and this popped up. And it is called Weem. W-E-A-M. And that is the Wiltzig Erotic Art Museum. Mrs. Wiltzig was an oil tycoon's wife, and she collected erotic art. Okay, so what's erotic art? Are we talking about porn here? Mm, you will remember the famous phrase that I know pornography when I see it. Well, it's all in the eye of the beholder. One person's erotic art is another person's pornography, and I can only tell you that a lot of what they have at this museum looks like art to me. You're on your own. Nothing about this is safe for work. When I give you the website, you probably don't want to use your work computer there because there is graphic nudity instantly. So just have that warning. That said, it looks like an actually interesting place. It's the only museum of its kind in the United States. And they leave a lot up to you. Apparently, they don't tell you about the piece. They just show you the piece give you the artist in a date or a location or something like that. And that's it. Now, one of the pieces they have, or at least had, I'm not sure it's still on display, is the giant phallus from the movie A Clockwork Orange. If you've never seen that movie, it's a pretty hard movie to watch, and there are some really gruesome scenes in there. And one of them in involves a giant phallus, and that phallus is in here. As an artistic statement, I'm sure it says something, but to some people, it's just going to be pornography. So, folks, you make your own decisions. Um, if you're in Miami, as I'm going to be, um, and you're looking for something to do, this would definitely be unique. This is, shall we say, not prurient. They're not trying to titillate people. They're trying to educate people. Uh, for example, the, the way the museum is broken up is there's an African, Native American, Native North American anyway section. There's an Art Deco section, an Asian section, a gay art section. That's specifically its own thing. There's stuff from India, from iconic artists, uh, a Wunderkammer, which is a cabinet of curiosities. That, that's probably where I would spend most of my time. There's even an entire section based on Lita and the Swan, which is a famous story in which a swan rapes a woman. And for some reason, this is something that artists painted all the time. So it's an art museum that has a topic that's a little bit risque, if not risky. And uh, anyway, you can check it out for yourself. It's weemmuseum.com. So that's W-E-A-M museum.com. And again, not safe for work. 
And uh, you have to be over 18 to get in, and I believe it costs $25, and the hours are posted on the site. So I might check this out. It, it looks kind of interesting. Uh, what is art? You know, you don't even have to be stoned to ask that question anymore. And this will really kind of push that envelope, I think, a little bit. Well, thank you very much for listening to episode 150. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And if you need to get a hold of me, I am Jeff at builttogo.com. That's two T's, not three, not one. And until next time, remember the words of Leonardo da Vinci. Art is never finished, only abandoned. <laughs>